Okay. So we've already established that at the heart of corporate governance is the need for the establishment of board of directors. Okay. So this lecture will focus on directors and board structure, all right? Based on the agency theory and other theories of uh, corporate governance, we've realized that we need to have uh, structures and systems in place. And one of them is the need for board of directors. At the heart of corporate governance is the need for board of directors. Okay, so that is what lecture or chapter nine is all about. So we'll be looking at the explanation of unit three board versus dual board, the board of directors, role duties and responsibilities of the board, chief executive officer, chairman or chairperson, company secretary, board subcommittees, non-executive directors, and the concept of board di uh, diversity. Okay. Based on all the explanations that we've had, I think we can run faster by now you've understood most, most of the issues. Okay. So one of the major distinctions in the practice of corporate governance across the globe is the use of unitary board or dual board structure. So in some jurisdictions, they use what is known as the unitary board, like Ghana, we we'll look at a Ghana, UK, USA. And in other jurisdictions, they use what is known as the dual board structure, okay? With the unitary board, it is made up of both executive and non-executive directors on a board. So when I was trying to explain something, I, I ex it was a question, I think by Linda, and I was trying to tell you that the CEO and some key management members of the company automatically become board members of a company. And they are referred to as executive directors. Why? Because they are also part of the management of the company. Okay. The non-executive directors are those, they are not part of the management of the company, but they are brought in because of their expertise, and, and business knowledge in, in some subject matters, all right? So in the unitary board, you have both the executive and the non-executive coming together to form a single board, as the case is in, uh, in Ghana, okay? We'll look at the dual board and you understand what, what I'm talking about. Then all directors work towards the same objectives and oversee all company operations. So in the unitary board, the rules are the same, all right? Both the executive and non-executive come together to serve the same objectives. The shareholders elect the directors to the board at the company's annual general meeting. I think I've said it earlier. So we have Ghana, UK, and the USA use this type of board structure. So that is the description of the unitary board. Then we have the dual board. It's made up of a supervisory board and an executive board of management. So in the dual board structure, we will normally have two boards, board of directors of the company. So those that we will have called non-executive under the unitary board, now together will form what is known as the supervisory board, okay? And those that we will have referred to as the executive directors will together form what is known as the executive board of management. So in the dual board, you have two boards. One of the board is a supervisory board, like we know uh, the role of uh, boards to be. Then we have the executive board of management. So look at the distinction. The management board, this one, is in charge of the day-to-day -day operations whilst the supervisory board decides how the company will be operated. So the management board is as we know it as a management team in organizations, okay? Yes, then we have the supervisory board. Maybe key members of the management team will form the management board. Then we have the supervisory board that will supervise or oversee the activities of the board of management or the management board. All right. Members of one board cannot be members of another. So there is a clear distinction between management and control. So if you are part of, 
the management board, you cannot also be part of the supervisory board, as we have in the case of unitary board. All right. Shareholders appoint the supervisory board members, and the supervisory board appoints the management board members. Okay, so I think this is clear. Commonalities between unitary and dual board structures. One, shareholders elect the supervisory board in both forms of um, board structure. Okay, when it comes to the supervisory board, it is the shareholders that will have to elect, whether it's a unitary or dual board structure, the shareholders that will do the election, right? Both are in charge of making sure legal requirements are followed. So for both boards, compliance with legal requirement is what they want their companies to do. Appoint the members of the managerial body. So you realize that in the case of the unitary board, both the executive um, and non-executive directors will normally deliberate, depend upon the, the position that is declared vacant. They will work together to get a competent person to fill that particular position, okay? So they will be responsible for the appointment of the managerial team. It is even clearer in the dual board structure. In the dual board structure, it is the shareholders that will appoint the supervisory board and the supervisory board will appoint members of the management board or yes, management board of the company. Okay. A common approach to areas, they have common approach to areas relating to the function of boards and board committees. So in both types of boards, they have commonality in terms of the functions of boards and board committees, board independence, and the consideration of shareholders' interest whenever they're making decisions. The board of directors. So the board of directors, the board serves as a conduit between managers and shareholders. I think we we'll understand this now, all right? So if the shareholders that will appoint the directors, the directors will appoint the managers. So they serve as a conduit intermediary between management and shareholders. They are considered to be essential for sound corporate governance and investor relations, okay? As I said, most investors will be looking at the caliber of people on the board of a company when they are making their investment decisions. Okay, once you have a very good and strong board, all things being equal, the company is likely to be managed well, and they are likely to get their returns or investment with some uh, good returns on that. Directors or board of directors guide and govern the operations of organizations. We've established that. The chairman or chairperson is in charge of managing the board. So the person who will be in charge of calling meetings, uh, deciding on agenda for meetings and so on and so forth is normally known as the chairman of the board. Okay, so we have the role of the board. The board is responsible for setting the company's goals and how to achieve those aims. So it's almost like the strategic direction of the company. That is to be determined by the board of directors of the company. Okay, the board is responsible for monitoring progress made towards achieving those goals, and also for appointing a CEO with necessary leadership skills. Okay, so this is why when a company is not performing well, the board cannot recuse themselves or withdraw from that failure, because you are responsible for appointing a competent and, and a good CEO to run the affairs of the company. So if you were the one appointing the CEO and you appointed the wrong person and the person fails, then obviously you must take part of the blame for the failure of the company. Okay. Key difficulties facing corporate boards include creating more diverse boards of directors. So the composition is, an, is always a tony issue when it comes to board of directors. Okay, board diversity the need for minority group, the need for female, 
And when you are appointing, you have to be thinking about the functional areas of business. You probably need somebody in marketing, you need a legal person, you need somebody with IT background, and so on and so forth. If you are fortunate, you may get a lot of those qualities in one person, okay? But most, most times, you may have to then appoint several people with different backgrounds and expertise in order to form a very solid board, okay? They have to focus more on improving the effectiveness of the board. That is another difficulty. You may have the board, but how effective is it? Do they meet to discuss issues of the company? Uh, when they meet, what are the what is the nature of the discussion? Okay, do they make any meaningful contribution as far as the governance of the company is concerned? All right. Another difficulty is responding appropriately to any changes in the corporate governance culture. All right. So most of the time when there is the need for change, as we've always been saying, change is quite difficult. And so when there must be the need to change structures and the way companies are governed, it poses a challenge to uh, board of directors. So high performance boards must achieve three core objectives. For boards that want to consider themselves to be highly performing, they must provide superior strategic guidance to ensure companies' growth and prosperity. I said at the heart of the board of directors, their function is strategic planning and management. Okay, so for a board to be described as high, high performance board, they should be able to provide strategic guidance. Ensure that highly qualified executive team is managing the company. That is also very important. And I just explained that. If the company fails and you are part of the board, you can't go blaming the management. Okay? If management fails, it means the board didn't do their homework well. They should have taken the pains and time to pick qualified people to form the executive team or the management team of the company. Then finally, high performance board ensure accountability of the company to its stakeholders. Okay, so they won't just allow management to do anything, but they will hold management accountable to the stakeholders of the company. Duties and responsibilities of the board, there are so many of them. So the board, the, the board works as a friend, philosopher, and a guide for the company. So as we just said, they have to provide the strategic guidance for the company. That is one of the role or duties. It appoints independent directors, okay? That is also very, very important to get people that are not part of the management of the company so that they can help in providing unbiased suggestions and, and guidance for the company to succeed. <laughs> They are responsible for monitoring the overall activities of the company. The board ensures the availability of financial resources. So if you remember our resource dependency theory, okay, that is one of the reasons why a company needs boards. You need people with connections that can help attract investment into the company. So the board ensures that as well. It approves annual budgets. Okay, so this is where the monitoring also comes in. So you should have scrutinized the budget and then uh, identified or approved that the budget is really good to go before signing off. Okay, it fixes up salaries and compensation for the management. So that is another rule of the board. Then we have the chief executive officer. So it's like the head of the management team of any company. Okay, so the CEO is responsible for directing the company's operations. The roles of the CEO and the chairman should not be merged and carried out by one person. So that is why we're talking about CEO duality. For good corporate governance, there is the need for separation between the CEO and the chairperson or the chairman of the board of any company. Okay, Millicent, I can see you all. <clears throat> Yes, sir. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Yes, sir. Please, uh, with the duties and responsibilities of the board, mm -hmm. when it comes to the delegation of duties, 
let's say they say segregate the duty, let's say for instance, uh, a board is made up of nine people, mm -hmm. and then one person is in charge of the financial aspect, the other person is in charge of the welfare of the company. This mm -hmm. person is that is that the right way to go about it? So, or anybody at all can perform any duty at a given period of time. No, so very soon we'll be looking at committees. Okay, board okay. committees. And you see that we have various committees making up the board of a company. So it's the committee okay. where you find yourself in the committee that will determine what you should be doing for the company. Okay. okay. Uh -huh. So when okay. the committee finalizes its work, that was when in the previous lecture, I was comparing that to how parliament operates. So they will normally, if it is about audits, the board will have people with expertise in accounting and auditing and they hand over the documents to that committee to work on thoroughly before they come to the entire board for them to discuss. If it is about risk management, the board is supposed to have people with expertise in risk management and so on and so forth. So that is how the board operates. Okay. I hope that is clear. Yes, please. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. So the chairperson of the board is responsible for the running of the board. And he ensures or she ensures that the board meets frequently. Okay. Ensures that directors have access to all the information they need. Hold meetings with the non-executive directors without the executives present. Okay. So in the case of Unitary Board, you still have at some point in time to hold meetings with the non-executive directors because you want at that point to get more objective uh, suggestions and opinions on certain matters. Instead of meeting both the non and executive and the executive, all right? I hope by now it is clear. The executives are like the management. They are part of the management of the company. So if they are present, they will always want to defend their decisions, all right? But sometimes their decisions may be wrong. So the, the chair may want to have meetings where they, he meets or she meets with only the non-executive directors. All right, good. An important part of the management of a company and especially the board is to have uh, an office known as a company secretary, okay? The, the company secretary is not, <laughs> He or she is not the same as the ordinary mean of a secretary as we know it in everyday language, all right? Secretary, somebody who takes minutes, uh, what again, he has some boss somewhere that he follows to the meeting here and there. Yes, part of it consists of that. But this particular position is, is uh, top level management position in, in serious organizations, okay? So if you call, if you know somebody to a, co a company secretary in a company, it's part of the top, top guys of a company. Sometimes, most times the company secretary must be a lawyer because most of the things that will be happening will border on law and keeping up regulations, okay? Keeping up or matching up with regulations. So the person is either a lawyer or an, a whole law firm can be hired or employed to be the company secretary for another company, okay? So some of the duties will cover the things that we know of a secretary, the ordinary secretary, but the duties of a company secretary exceeds that and goes into issues of legalities. And so the company secretary is very, very important and the management and governance of companies and organizations. Okay, I just want you to get that context right before you start thinking that we're talking about just a typist, right? Yeah, or somebody who takes notes at during meetings. This position is top level management position and it's normally reserved for lawyers. Even though there is there are professional programs uh, chatted something of secretaries where if you complete, you can become a company secretary, but largely the courses in there are, are, are legal courses or course that, courses that border on law. Okay. 
So the company secretary must act honestly and abstain from conflict of interest. Okay, in, in carrying out his or her duties as company secretary, and I said even organizations, law firms can be employed as company secretaries. They must avoid conflict of interest. They have variety of responsibilities. And I said some include the minutes thing, the agenda for meetings thing, but largely it also has some legal duties. They have legal duties to perform. Advises the board through the chairman. The dismissal of the company secretary is a decision for the board as a whole and not just a CEO or chairman of a board. So you see how important that position is. Okay, it's not the ordinary secretary that you can just dismiss as you want. But if you want to dismiss a, sec a company secretary, you need the approval of the entire board, okay? You, the chair or the CEO, cannot dismiss the company secretary. So it's not an ordinary employee in a company for the CEO to fire like he can do with other employees or she can do with other employees. Good. So we come to board subcommittees. The board may establish, delegate, and remain responsible for the areas covered by subcommittees. Okay, so the board can choose to do all of these things that we are coming to talk about, but to ensure efficiency, they will normally set up subcommittees to handle these issues. Okay, so typical subcommittees are what we have here. This, this is not exhaustive. Depending upon the size and the type of organization, they may have more or less, okay? And the names may vary a bit. But typically, these are some of the committees that you'll find in most organizations. We have audits, we have compensation, we have nomination, we have ethics, we have risk management committee, okay? What it means is that if you want to find yourself in, in the board of a company, you need to be preparing yourself with expertise in these various areas, okay? Audit is more of accounting. Compensation issues will be more of HR, all right? Nomination, yes, HR as well, to be able to employ the right people. Ethics will border on knowledge in corporate governance and ethics as well as law, okay? Risk management, yes, it could be, depend upon the type of risk management. If it is financial knowledge in banking, knowledge in law, and all that could help. So these are the areas that you need to prepare yourself if you want to be part of a board. Because, because they'll be forming committees in these areas, they will need people with expertise in these areas. Okay. So the functions of board committees include to expedite the completion of business by giving it more thought than the entire board. So instead of bringing a matter to the entire board where there will be so much jaw uh, jaw and there won't be in-depth analysis of the issue, they will rather hand it over to a committee so that they can give the matter more thought and, 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 and analysis in order to come up with the best decision. The second goal is to promote impartiality, all right? So if there is an issue, for example, uh, compensation. If there is a compensation issue and the issue should be decided by the entire board, don't forget executive directors are part of the entire board. And if they have to determine their own salary, there is a higher tendency for them to be biased or to favor themselves, okay? So this compensation committee will not normally include the executive directors. In fact, most of the committees will not include the executive directors in order to promote impartiality. So the committee will do their own investigations and work and determine the decision that the board should make without people with interest being part of the committee. Okay, so let's look at them now one by one. So here, what is important is to know what the committee is and the role that they perform, all right? Yes. So the audit committee is considered as the most significant board subcommittee. They are made up of independent non-executive directors. Okay, so these words are not just thrown about. So they are independent. We will later look at what 
an independent director means, all right? And they are also non-executive. By now, we know the non-executive. They shouldn't be part of the management of the company because the audit committee will be auditing the executives of the company. Act independently from the executive. So it's similar to this. They are supposed to be independent of the executive because they will be auditing or scrutinizing the activities of the executive. It ensures that the interests of shareholders are properly protected in relation to financial reporting and internal control. Okay, so basically that is what they are supposed to do. They review the scope and results of audits. So this point is actually, you know, companies have internal auditors as well. And apart from looking at the raw financial statement, they may want to seek the opinion and the reports of internal auditors. So they will review the scope and the results of the internal auditors. Then provides a helpful bridge between both internal and external auditors and the board. All right. So even before the external auditors will come to scrutinize the works of the management and, and uh, the internal audit or whatever, uh, unit or department of the company, the audit committee of the company, if they have good expertise in that committee, should have verified and audited the activities of the company. And so they help serve as a bridge between the internal and external auditors of a company. Okay, right. So for those of you that might not be familiar with uh, this auditing work, the internal auditors are normally like employees of the company. It is normally the head, maybe the head of audit that will be part of the management team. But largely those that will be working under him will just be ordinary employees. Okay, so why we shouldn't, we can't rely on them is because they are employees, they can be fired. And the CEO can have an influence over them. But they are there to make sure that the company is keeping with the accounting standards and requirements. Okay, after they are done, their report and other things must get to the board and the audit committee must look at what they have done and also check the financial statement to make sure that things are being done well, all right, before even external auditors come. <clears throat> so they will serve as a bridge between the internal external auditors as well as the board of the company. Remuneration committee. Annual report should include a list of the committee. So the people that decided who should get what. The chairman and the executive board decide the compensation of non-executive directors. So when it comes to deciding the allowances and compensation for non-executive directors, I said these are those, the guys who are not part of the management of the company. It is the executive board and the chair of the board that will determine this. So if you remember earlier also, we said when it comes to the executives also, it will be the non-executive that will determine that, okay? So if you don't have people that have integrity, directors that have integrity, it's just like scratch my back and I'll scratch your back, okay? But if you have people with integrity, they will make sure that they're right and they stand and they will not just be paying themselves huge salaries and compensations. Okay, so some duties and responsibilities of the remuneration committee is to determine specific compensation packages for each executive director, make recommendations to the board regarding the executive's compensation framework. All right, then we have the nomination committee. Once again, it is composed primarily of independent non-executive directors. So, so far you realize that the executive directors don't play a major role when it comes to this committee work, okay? Mostly it is done by the non-executive directors. The chair of the committee may be the CEO of the firm or a non-executive independent director, all right? So there may be occasions that the CEO, for example, if you want to replace the CEO, and this time around, the placement is not antagonistic, all right? The person is probably just retiring. And therefore, it is natural that somebody must replace him. You may want him to chair this nomination committee because he has experience 
when it comes to the management of the company, okay? But in other cases, you may need a non-executive independent director to chair the committee when it comes to nomination, okay? The chairman should not chair the nomination committee when it is considering the appointment of a chair, a chairman ship replacement, all right? If there's the chairman, if we want to replace the chair of the board, all right, the point is that then the chair cannot be part of the committee in seeking who will replace him as the chair of the board. That is what that point is saying. The committee leads the process for board appointments and makes recommendations to the board. So the board members normally will have some number of years that they should serve. Okay, I think maximum three years or so. It's meant to prevent the situation where the board becomes so close to management that they cannot scrutinize their activities, okay? So boards normally have a rotational system where maybe one badge will serve for three years. And after the three years has expired, another set of directors will come in. Then they will serve three years. After the three years, maybe the old set will come in and so on and so forth. We'll be looking at that very soon. So it's the nomination committee that will make recommendations as to who should be a board member. Okay. Then we have the RICS Management Committee. The RICS Management Committee makes sure that uh, makes sure that directors are aware of their responsibility for the company's internal controls, okay? So in ordinary business, risk management is more financial controls, internal controls, the checks and balances in the company are met. So risk management is there to ensure that. Okay, secondly, to ensure that the company's internal controls and risk management systems are functioning effectively all right so the checks and balances financial non-financial are in place to ensure that no disaster will befall the company or take company the company unawares okay so let's look at non-executive directors i've tried explaining them or yes what it is previously a key component of effective governance so you don't want a board that will be dominated by just the executive directors. It will have been good you didn't have a board in the first place, okay? So non-executive directors are key in ensuring effective corporate governance. They act as a check or on or counterbalance to executive directors, We should know that by now, contributes to the overall company's overall management and growth. According to the Cadbury report, site directors should be chosen with the same objectivity and care as top executives. Okay, so you can't, you don't just pick anybody at all to come as a non-executive director. There should be people that are independent-minded and, and have a lot of expertise and experience in their area of specialization. Okay, so now we look at the concept of independence. <clears throat> If you remember when we we're talking about board composition, we didn't just mention non-executive directors. In most cases, we said it should be, it should be an independent non-executive director. What it means is that you could have a non-executive director who is not independent, okay? So how do we know? Or what are the criteria in determining whether a non-executive director is uh, independent? Okay, so let's look at this. Situations where a non-executive director's independence will be questioned. So once you have some of these things, questions around your neck or issues around your neck, you cannot be described as, a, as an independent non-executive director. So let's look at some of them. Where the director was a former employee of the company or group within the last five years. Okay, so if you were a former employee of the company or the group in which the company belongs to for the last five years, 
and you are appointed a director, you cannot be considered as an independent non-executive director. Okay. Where additional remuneration apart from director's fee was received from the company. So if you receive any additional payment besides director's fee, for example, if you were the lawyer to the company, all right, what it means is that you are no, you will normally be paid legal fees. Sometimes it's like contractual every month, even though you are not an employee, you are like an independent contractor and every month they pay you some, some legal fees for being the lawyer of the company, okay? If you were then appointed a director for that particular company, you cannot be considered to be an independent director, all right? Because apart from director's fee, you also receive additional remuneration from the company, okay? Point three, where the director had close family ties with the company's other directors and advisors. So if you appointed a director and you have family relations, not just with the other directors, but also the relatives of the other directors, then you cannot be considered to be an independent contractor. Okay? Especially so when uh, the relations are executive directors. What it means is that those directors have the capacity to influence you from the family ties that you have with them, okay? Where he or she had served on the board for more than 10 years. So if you have served on the board of a particular company for more than 10 years, in subsequent years when they appoint you, you cannot be described as an independent non-executive director where he or she had a material business relationship with the company in the last three years. So assuming you were a supplier of the company, you were supplying them with some stuff for them to operate, then you cannot be considered to be, for the last three years, you cannot be considered to be an in independent non-executive director. Okay, but pay attention to the year's limitations. Okay, what it means is that if for the past three years you've not made any supplies to the company, then you may be considered as independent. Okay. Then finally, where he or she represented a significant shareholder. So if you're a significant shareholder, you may be appointed as a non-executive director, but you cannot be considered to be an independent because you have a financial interest or stake in the company. Okay, so these are the characteristics or attributes that will help us to determine whether a director, a non-executive director is independent or not. Of course, executive director cannot be independent because it's already part of the management of the company. Okay, any questions? Any questions? If there are no questions, let's continue. So contributions of non-executive directors, they are considered to add value. So added value from a number of facets or areas, such as experience in the industry, their public life. We spoke about their community influence. So they come with a lot, okay, to the company. They, they, are, they, they add value to companies. Knowledge of particular functional special, specialism. So I've explained this already. So you can, they will normally pick people with expertise. If there's auditing, they will need people in finance and accounting. If they are interested in marketing, they will pick somebody from that. So the person comes with expertise in these functional areas of business. They tend to have knowledge in particular technical process or system as well, okay? Sometimes the company is into IT or technology, so they need somebody with such technical knowledge and a non-executive director can help. Okay. Then they bring on board reputation. I've said it over and over again, the contribution of this, okay? Not just in helping, make, uh, helping the organization to take good decisions, but also investors will be looking at that person when it comes to making investment decisions. 
Then they bring on board the ability to have an insight into issues and to ask searching questions. So because they are not part of the management team, they normally all, all ask uh, questions that ordinary uh, directors or other executive directors will not be able to ask the CEO, okay? So they bring insight because they are people that also understand business. Some of them may even be retired CEOs themselves. So they have a lot of knowledge about how organizations and companies should be governed. All right. Let's move to director's evaluation. So the board of directors, their work will normally be evaluated, all right, in order to ensure that they are not just uh, taking salaries or allowances. So, sorry, not allowances, uh, not salaries, but the um, allowances that they are given, uh, perks that they are given, all right? So we have to evaluate and make sure that they are adding value to the company, okay? So we can evaluate the board as a whole. You can use a, a structured question to evaluate how the board is performing in key areas, okay? You can also have an informal discussion with the chairman of the board and the directors to have a feel of how well the board is performing, all right? And then you can also evaluate the performance of individual directors on the board, okay? So that also provides opportunity to discuss key areas with the chairman, on a one-to-one -one basis. So if you are not happy with any uh, performance of any director, you may want the chair of the board to know about that. So the evaluation can be done for the entire board or the board as a whole, or we can do an evaluation for the individual directors of the board. Good, as part of the board issues and, and management of company. Companies must pay attention to succession planning, all right? <clears throat> Especially at the top level. You must at any point in time have an idea as to who will become the next CEO, who is likely to become the next chair of the board. You don't wait until anything happens before you start the process, okay? So good succession planning is part of good corporate governance. All right. So it's meant to maintain an appropriate balance of skills and experience within the company. So at any point in time, you have to be looking out, okay, which areas is the company lacking? Who else will we need so that you can have a balance of skills and experience within the company to ensure progressive refreshing of the board? So when it comes to the board also, as I said, even by law, they will not be bought for members forever, okay? They have some maximum years that they have to serve. The whole idea, as I said earlier, is to avoid a situation where they will get comfortable with management and therefore their independence may be compromised. The other one is that if you keep uh, them for a long time, they may not be able to bring in any new ideas or refreshing ideas. So you need a succession plan to keep changing or rotating them. Okay, then it will ensure orderly appointments of succession to the board and to senior management. All right. Then we have our last concepts uh, so that we have to look at board diversity. Okay, it's coming up. It's part of the sociological theory of corporate governance. The fact that you need diversification, inclusion, when it comes to the formation of boards. So board diversity looks at the board composition in terms of gen gender, nationality, ethnic background, and so on and so forth, all right? Ferrara addresses potential costs and advantages of board ad ad uh, diversity, all right? So the cost, if you have a very diverse board, there could be conflict because they have different opinions on issues, okay? There could be lack of cooperation, basically because of the same reason. There are different people, different backgrounds. Insufficient communication, they don't know each other, and so on. They, are, they have differences, so there could be insufficient uh, communication. There could be conflicts of interest. Because they are coming from different backgrounds, they may be interested in protecting 
their own interest, okay, or where they are coming from. It's very similar to agenda pushing, where they seek to project only issues that will serve their interests or where they are represented, okay? Then it could lead to choosing directors with inadequate qualifications, all right? Just because there is the need for a female doesn't mean we should pick any female who doesn't have knowledge when it comes to management and governance of companies. But that is where companies could get into, okay? Where because there is the need for diversity, people will be chosen, not necessarily female, right? People will be elected to be on the board without the requisite knowledge and qualifications just because they want the board to be diverse. Okay. But there are advantages. One is that there is creativity and different perspectives. So you have different people coming together. So there is a likelihood that there will be more creative ideas than people who think alike. Okay. It could lead to access to resources and connections because you're tapping from people from different backgrounds, different affiliations. And so it can lead to the acquisition of resources and connections to other areas. Mm -hmm. Then there is career incentives, okay? So no matter your career, you, you have the chance because of the need for diversity, all right? We won't just appoint only lawyers. Mm -hmm. Okay, or it's not right to appoint only accountants. And so because of the diverse nature, there is an incentive to master whatever field that you find yourself in. So if you're an HR person, there could be a slot for you. If you're into accounting, all that you need is to be good at what you do. Okay, board diversity is good PR, public relations. So if you have women there, when you are advertising or selling, you can emphasize the point that you help even employ women or you have a woman on your board and so on and so forth. If you have minority group, especially in even uh, football teams, right? Even though it's not like, it's not a board, but I realize that most countries, including Ghana, we all shift our support whenever we know that we have a Ghanaian on a particular team, okay? I think the reigning team now is, is a West Ham, uh, where is this guy? Oh, Kudus, right? Kudus team. Yes, is it West Ham. Yes, yeah, West Ham. West West uh huh. So yes, all West of Ham. a sudden, all of a sudden, all of us have become West Ham. Yeah, uh, I remember when uh, ASEAN was at Chelsea. Okay, almost half of Ghanaians were Chelsea fans. When he left, now people have found their way to other clubs. So that is the idea. If you have different representation, you can have good public relations among in those cortes. Then investor relations as well can improve, all right? So if you have different people, then the investors are also people from different backgrounds. So you can improve your relations with them. Then there is legitimacy, all right? Legitimacy is when you gain acceptance from society or the community within which you are operating. Because you've taken into consideration or the interests of diverse interest group, there is a higher likelihood that you'll be accepted. And that is where legitimacy is coming from. Okay. So action list for deciding board composition. If you wanted to compose a board, these are some of the things that you have to look at. So consider the ratio and number of executive and non-executive directors, okay? It will be inappropriate to, for example, to have more executive directors on the board, more than the non-executive directors. If you do that, any matter that should be left to a vote will be carried by the executive. But the non-executives are supposed to check these guys, all right? So at any point in time, you have to ensure that you have more non-executive directors. Worst case scenario, they should be even, all right? Then consider the energy, experience, knowledge, skill, and personal attributes of parent and prospective directors. Very, very important. So don't just pick people because they will come and agree with you and, or allow you to do whatever you want. No, that is not how to pick members of boards. 
you have to look at and also age matters right don't just pick some some elderly person who has no energy he can't sit for long and so on and so forth so you want to pay attention to that as much as you want experience you want to be mindful of energy as well okay so experience, knowledge, skill, personal attributes. Is it a, a person? Is it a team player? Can he work in a team? Or is somebody who wants to do things? He wants to insist on his own way. Okay. Board work is a teamwork. So you need to pay attention to the personal attributes of the people you want to appoint as directors. All right. Close to the last point that I just explained is that Consider the cohesion, dynamic, dynamic tension, and diversity of the board and its leadership by the chairman, all right? So pay attention. The people, the team that you are bringing together, uh, can they gel, can they work together, all right? Most times, people are not employed into some organizations, not because they don't have the knowledge and skills, all right? It's just because of their personality or if you want soft skills. The, the panel will be paying attention to whether the team that they have already, based on your personality traits, whether you can fit into that particular team. All right. So it's the same thing when it comes to board composition. You must be paying attention to board uh, dynamics and, and, and tension in order to ensure that your team or your board functions appropriately. Okay. So thank you very much. I think this is the end for this particular topic. Um, are there any questions? Are there any questions? Okay. <laughs>